everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat podcast today. Today is just not a great day. It's a wonderful day because I get to have a special guest come by our podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group, and we're here to talk to Ken Medlock. He's got a job title that's about as long or as big as Texas. He's over, he's a doctor over at a PhD over at Rice University. He's with the James Baker III and Susan Baker Fellow in Energy Resource Economics. We have some shared connections, uh, and I'm excited to have this talk today. Uh, Ken, thank you for stopping by. Pleasure to be here, Stu. Uh, we were chit-chatting right before the, the show here, and you've got some other things uh, as a doctor over there at Rice. Tell us what you got going on over there. Oh, yeah. So I, um, in addition to my fellowship title uh, here at the Baker Institute, um, I'm also the senior director of the Center for Energy Studies. Nice. Um, we've been ranked uh, number one in the world uh, among all energy and natural resource think tanks. Um, we're moved into the category center of excellence by the ratings group, which is based out of University of Pennsylvania. Uh, just a couple of years ago. So it's um, it, it's an honor to work with the folks I work with here. It's it's a reflection of, of the collective expertise of, of our shop. Um, and I'm also uh, co-director of the Master of Energy Economics program in the economics department here at Rice. It sounds great. And you're also a, a fact, a, an advisor, education thought leadership for the Texas Co uh, Carbon Neutral Coalition, correct? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm an, I'm an academic advisor. Um, okay. Basically, when they have questions about things that they're contemplating, they reach out and ask for my thoughts, um, and I give them to right. them, so. Well, that's fantastic. I thoroughly enjoy, uh, I've had the pleasure of interviewing a few folks from over there, and uh, Susan and Chuck are just phenomenal folks and everything else. So, all right, we're going to have some great discussions here. We want to cover uh, some ideals, uh, ideas and what you're seeing. Um, how long have you been teaching? Because uh, you seem uh. like, uh, you know, uh, there's you, you and I were kind of laughing about some of the students and stuff and body language and things like that. How long have you been teaching? I actually started teaching when I was still in graduate school. So that's going to go back to 1998. Um, nice. And I've been teaching consecutively. I, I taught you know, the last two years of my graduate degree, um, went into the private sector for about four and a half years and continued to teach. I worked out an agreement where I could teach a class in the morning at Rice and continue to do that. And then came back to Rice full time in 2004. So collectively, I've uh, been teaching about 25 years. So Nice. You know, I I always love academia, uh, but I I went to Oklahoma State University and got a two two five overall in there, so I was not real interested in college, and I had to cover it up with another degree from somewhere else. So I always thought I seem to be doing okay. So <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I, I always thought I'd retire and go be a college professor and then get my PhD and everything else, but I'm having too much fun being a podcast host. So podcast host, and you know, I don't know. Let's get into the CCUS and the carbon capture and storage. What are some of the biggest things you're working on right now and that you're trying to see in the industry around carbon capture and, and those things? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, it is first of all, I'll say it's it's a rapidly evolving space, and it just a few years ago was really a blank canvas. Um, so a lot of policy overlay, a lot of you know interest by different um, different actors, uh, not only in the oil and gas arena, but really anybody who's interested in promoting carbon capture and sequestration so they can get credit for it against their own carbon footprint, right? There's all sorts of things going on. Um, we published a report, uh, and this is actually really got what got me connected with, with, with the Carbon Neutral Coalition. We published a report two years ago, uh, February, nice. on opportunities to uh, really scale carbon capture, cap, cap, carbon capture and sequestration in the state of Texas. So it was very regionally focused. Um, generally, we take that kind of an approach with our research protocols because particularly when you're getting into deploying assets and steel on the ground and making investments, it, it gets local really fast, right? Oh, so 
Um, lots of federal overlay here, um, you know, with the uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot of stimulus that's been put in place. The expansion of 45Q, for example, to you know really kind of create a lot of momentum behind carbon capture and sequestration as a viable opportunity commercially. Yeah. Um, where we kind of step in is, first of all, yeah, we can evaluate that, but there's not a lot of value add from a university perspective to say, yeah, this, this subsidy is going to do going to be great for promoting interest. I mean, the, the industry sort of makes that determination on its own. Right. Uh, where we step in is really in the, in the policy and regulatory space. So what, That's what huge. needs to happen, what needs right. to happen in order to see that these, uh, sort of intended stimulus packages actually do what they're designed to do. Um, and there's a set of issues that we, we like to track um, related to liability, permitting, siting of infrastructure, you know, a host of things that really, really is, you know, the devil's in the details, so to speak. But that's that's really where where you cut your teeth when you start thinking about getting these projects up and running. So um, there's there's a lot of interest from our perspective on that, really the policy dimension uh, so that the economics can actually work and a market can be created. Boy, when you talk about, uh, in fact, um, Secretary Granholm this past week said that they've got to overhaul the the regulations and the regulatory. And then you take a look at the the regulations the all the extra money that i'm seeing just in visiting with all the other folks the extra money that came in on the infrastructure uh, infrastructure bill and the inflation reduction bill they're now being drug out because of the regulations and the amount of time and how can the rice university help articulate that or change that because you mentioned that's some of your best yeah. focus how do you because that's a leadership role, a thought leadership role. How are sure. you doing that? Yeah. So you mentioned two specific legislative uh, packages. One was the IIJA, uh, sometimes right. referred to as a bipartisan partisan infrastructure law, right. um, but also the inflation, the IRA, uh, right. the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, both are tremendous stimulus packages for right. lower carbon energy. So there are provisions around developing hubs for hydrogen, for example. There's a massive uh, uh, push right now to develop hydrogen hubs all, all across the country. They're going to pick multiple locations. And, you know, the Gulf Coast of Texas is one of them. There's a few different proposals in play there. But to really make that a, uh, quote unquote, low carbon hydrogen hub, you have to think about integrating carbon capture. Because right. a lot of what is is true, a lot of what the industrial complex or core in the Gulf Coast is built on is a lot of infrastructure to move natural gas around. And natural gas is a massive feedstock for hydrogen production. Right. Um, and so if you can capture the carbon emissions associated with the production of hydrogen there, you get what's often termed as blue hydrogen, which is right. a low carbon source and you know a viable prospect for being attractive to those funds from the U.S. government. Um What's interesting about all that, right, is it's well intended uh, and it is game changing in terms of driving interest. But if you can't get a pipeline sited and permitted, if you can't, you know, get certain facilities developed, if you can't drill a well in state offshore or federal offshore waters to sequester carbon dioxide in subsurface saline aquifers, then all of that comes to a grinding halt. So there is a massive need for permitting to really address um, really the blind spot uh, in a lot of that, that legislation, which is, you know, it's nice to have these incentives in place, but they will, they're a road to nowhere absent the ability to build things. So um, right. I think that's being grappled with. You're seeing all sorts of signals out of the federal government. Um, and I'm hopeful that something will eventually come to pass, but there's still a lot to do. Right. Even beyond right. federal legislation, um, you know, in the state of Texas, you've still got you know local permitting issues that you have to address. Right. You've still got local incentives. You, there's even the issue of what is the regulatory overlay. Right. So if we talk about right. hydrogen, that's not clearly defined at all. There's actually a bill on the on the floor in the in the state legislature now for Texas to give that that legislative or that that regulatory authority to the Railroad Commission, which will be a good first step. Um, federally, there is no 
regulatory agency in charge of hydrogen, with the exception of the uh, Department of Transportation, but that's all on safety. It's not around market function or constructing new facilities or anything of the sort. So, you wow. know, you, you step into this, this sort of no man's land in a lot of ways because you don't know which regulatory body you're going to have to to deal with, which right. you know, what permits uh, and permitting challenges you're going to have in front of you as you try to mature these projects and move to FID and get to a point where you can actually begin to execute. Um, and I think that is that is where we come in, right? It's really about identifying those issues. We right. don't advocate. We're, we're not an advocacy group, right? We're, we're actually, um, I always say elevate, don't advocate. Um, and so the idea is to right. elevate the discussion to a point where the issues are identified so that appropriate action can be taken. When it comes to drafting legislation, writing bills, all that kind of stuff, right. I'll let the special interest groups do all that, right? For, for us, it's really just about raise these right. issues to the surface so that they can be seen. I'll tell you, that, that, that that's huge. I mean, when you sit back and take a look at some of the biggest issues that are out there right now with hydrogen and everything else, because hydrogen, uh, I I think, is going to be fantastic. And it really leads itself into natural gas because you can transport, yeah. uh, you know, with with adding some new uh, turbines to a, a natural gas pipeline, uh, you can use it to transport it. And that's where a lot of the problem is. Well, there, there are, in terms of moving hydrogen in natural gas facilities, there, there are some issues that are under study because um, hydrogen, okay. can, hydrogen can actually embrill steel. So you've got to have the right kind of facility in place to actually oh. move hydrogen. Uh, right. Now, there's experiments, how much hydrogen can I blend with natural gas and not right. you know, create a structural integrity issue? So there's a lot of, a lot of work to be done still there, uh, without right. a doubt. Um, but we in, in the state of Texas, we already have two thirds of the nation's hydrogen transportation infrastructure in place. So there are dedicated hydrogen pipelines. I did not uh, know that. And, yes. And there's ability yeah. to, to develop that stuff. Um, so this region is really well situated to um, become a hub, not just for hydrogen, but also for carbon right. capture, because the two are very intimately linked when you get down to, you know, ultimately how you make hydrogen and what you use it for. So um, it's it's really incumbent on um, lawmakers in the state to recognize that comparative advantage and actually put in place the appropriate constructs. And this is where you get into policy and market design so, right. that, so that private private actors or industry can act upon them. So um, I'll tell you, when you take a look at uh, the rainbow, if you would, of hydrogen, you know, you've got gray, green, blue, uh, purple, uh, you know, uh, green is when it's done with uh, um, uh, renewables and then blue. Right. Yeah, and anyway, but water is such a huge issue with hydrogen. What are you I mean, when you take a look at at that. Texas is a wonderful location because you can't always put hydrogen for manufacturing or anything else where there's no water. I mean, right? No, no you need uh, for electrolysis. You definitely need yes. a water resource, right? Um, for other forms of, of hydrogen production, that's uh, less of a constraint. So oh, okay, obviously, cool. if you're going to develop, um, you know, a, a you're going to cite an electrolyzer and you're going to use wind, uh, right. wind energy to drive the electrolyzer. So you're making hydrogen, you know, by splitting right. water molecules. Um, you're only going to do that in a place where you're not resource constrained. So you're going to have to have water available. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's an interesting example of how no matter what form of energy we talk about, there are right. resource constraints pre present. I mean, even oh, yeah. with renewables like wind and solar, you've got to have land for siting. And if you run out of land, then that's the constraint. Right. So there's, there's a constraint on, on every front. Um, right. It's just a matter of figuring out what that balance is and how to actually allocate those resources to deliver energy at the most reliable and low cost way possible. Boy, you're bringing up some uh, great points uh, on this kind of stuff. And I mean, when you you, you nailed it with um, how far out uh, and again, Texas is leading uh, the world, you know, I don't want to say the world, but, you know, we're the third largest, uh, you know, um, 
economy out there, whatever the number is. I mean, Texas is really a country and we all are proud of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, the transmission lines from all of the wonderful windmills and solar panels and everything else coming back into ERC. I mean, it's, they're all into ERCOT, but you got to bring all that from the West into the East, into Dallas and everything else. It's Those are not lightweight issues. No, siting transmission is um, is incredibly important to really harness the potential for renewables uh, in right. the state. Um, and it's not just West Texas. It's actually when you get into discussions of offshore, uh, oh, because yeah. the wind potential offshore is massive and you still got to develop, um, you know, the interconnect capability and the, right. the transmission cables offshore. And then the the sort of the nearest term sort of frontier for for wind and solar is really South Texas. So. Oh, yeah. um, again, there you're going to have to have some additional transmission capacity or transmission upgrades. And, you know, right. we're right back to talking about permitting and siting, right? So the, these issues are, are front and center, no matter what form of energy you, you want to talk about. And and I don't, I, I'm a little bit, um, I'd love to, you know, when you take a look at uh, reducing the amount of fossil footprint and carbon capture, Carbon capture goes wonderful with taking even the like the methane out of the oil and gas field or the carbon uh, capture. Occidental last year was the number one uh, company on the uh, uh, S&P 500, but they really kind of spun it around. And, you know, not only are they an oil and gas but they are going into the big, the carbon capture society, you know, and everything else. That's a huge market, Ken. When you take a look at what tr- they said, it's trillions or, you know, as Carl Sagan would say, billions upon billions. But now what's a few trillion between friends and budgets? But uh, that's a huge market. So carbon has been captured and used for a while. Um, right. in the state of Texas, right? So this is where you, you get to carbon capture utilization and storage. So the idea that you can capture CO2, um, you know, or you can actually <clears throat> extract CO2 from, from natural occurring formations and pipe it into West Texas, which happens right. as well, uh, and inject it into the subsurface to increase pressure in the reservoir and lift more oil and right. gas. That's been happening for a long time. That's just enhanced oil recovery. That's that's EOR is what we often hear that referred to as. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that sites, um, you know, when this stuff is injected, it's it's injected in a super, super critical form. So it can actually create right. that pressure drive and lift. And um, most of it stays in the subsurface. Um, the right. pushback is, well, yeah, but you're, you're doing that, but you're lifting more hydrocarbon molecules and you're going to end up creating more CO2 on the other side. And um, that's fair. Um, but what Oxy's interested in doing is creating effectively a circular or zero carbon crude, right? right. So right. Right. Well, you yeah. use direct air capture and you use the CO2 to enhance uh, recovery of oil. So you're pulling the CO2 out of the atmosphere rather than, you know, extracting it um, um, yeah. from, from other means. Um, and so that, that has a lot of potential and a lot of promise. It's expensive. Uh, you're right. talking about when you talk about direct air capture, extracting 0.04% of a stream. Um, because that's the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So when you think about that, that's a that's a difficult engineering problem. But you know, it's like anything else. When you, when you boil it down to a technical issue, you don't. I don't think it's safe to bet against humankind because right. we're pretty good at, at figuring those things out um, historically, and I think we will in this case as well. But um, you know, beyond that, there there are lots of other opportunities for deploying carbon capture and then just just straight up sequestration. Um, and there's also, I'll just throw this out there. There's a tremendous amount of research going into how do you utilize carbon that's captured um, to create right. materials. So, in advanced material applications, advanced chemistry applications. Um, so turn it into a product rather than than something that's a byproduct and a cost, uh, because if you can do that, it changes the commercial mindset dramatically. Oh, oh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, as the James uh, Baker and Susan Baker uh, Fellowship and the leadership, what a great thing for Rice University, your fellowship and everything else, because Texas, all of you are right here. And I was reading that 
some of my contacts up in uh, uh, Europe, they were looking at the the technology that was going on, just as you mentioned, with carbon capture in Texas, so they can start using it in the North uh, Sea and in those yeah. other areas. Because they're well, to- yeah. So-, so in the North Sea, the, the the largest active carbon capture and sequestration project is actually in Norway. So that's that's right. yes. that's already um, operating, right? And it's it's sort of something that came about because of um, for legal reasons, right? There was a requirement imposed by the government and. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the industry there stepped up and, and really uh, met it head on. Um, the, the technologies that are being developed um, everywhere will have spillover effects. And the potential right. for Texas to be a leader in that space is absolutely enormous because we right. are uh, endowed with a tremendous uh, fossil resource, so oil and gas. Right. Um, we have uh, incredible human capital depth and expertise in, in extracting and moving right. and refining and processing all of that stuff to make it usable for the rest of humanity. Um, right. And we also, because of that, have um, you know a massive uh, expertise in logistics and supply chain management that is unmatched really anywhere in the world. And oh, yeah. think about the ports. You know, in the state of Texas, you think about the pipeline networks, the transportation corridors, all of the goods and services that move in and out of and along those those arteries. Um, It's just it's it's massively important when you think about, you know, developing low carbon energy solutions and what 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 role Texas can play in actually leading the world uh, on this front. So it's it's the potential is there. We've just got to see that it's realized. You know, um, not that I'm trying to be nice to you or anything, Ken, but, you know, education uh, of this whole energy, uh, everything's uh, critical on the energy crisis going on right now, getting to carbon net zero. You have the folks over here and where you're at is at truly the intersection. And I loved your comment uh, about uh, you got to have the regulatory issues solved. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, uh, you and, and Rice uh, University here, and then with the Carbon Coalition, unbelievable, right at the crossroads of all of these things. What do you see coming around the corner? What are you working on right now? Boy, uh, lots of things. <laughs> um, I'll give you a, a little, just a brief <clears throat> background on on the, the Baker Institute and the Center for Energy Studies here at Rice. And <clears throat> That'll give you some insight into all these different touch points. Um, right. So here at, at the center, we have programs uh, that are on incumbent fuels like oil and gas and what their role in, in transitions will be, what their role in providing energy security will be, you know, how that is different in different parts of the world. So right. what's happening in Europe and how transitions will evolve in Europe is not going to look anything like what happens in Asia. Um, and even in Asia, China is going to look different than India. That's going to look different than Indonesia. You know, pick a country in the world. There's a different path they all will walk. Um, so bringing that to light is a major point of emphasis for us um, because it really highlights how you can't paint with broad brushstrokes. And you know, right. regulatory and uh, uh, regulatory architecture and market design, all these things will have tremendous implications for how things ultimately unfold in different regions around the world. Um, We also have a lot, we're doing a lot of work on uh, minerals and materials. Um, There's a ton of interest in, you know, what the uh, minerals, metals, and materials load will be for certain types of energy choices. And so it's... uh, uh, it's an area of intense, um, intense focus, uh, if you will, for us. Um, we're also doing work on electricity policy, um, which, you know, as you as anybody knows, if they just watch the news over the last couple of years, has been a major talking point uh, in almost every right, circle. Right. Um, we're also doing work uh, that's focused on uh, on environmental issues, ranging from waste and recycling to circularity to water. Uh, to hydrogen, to carbon capture. So there's right. a we have lots of fingers and lots of pies, and we also have very focused regional programs, like on on Latin America, on the Middle East, on Asia, and Europe. So 
we're doing lots, right? <clears throat> um, all of that connects, though, when you start talking about transitions. And what's really interesting is you see a very distinct connection around two things, um, hydrogen and carbon capture. So we, we released a study not too long ago on hydrogen. It's available on our website, uh, focused on Texas and what the opportunities are. But the study addresses what's happening globally as well. Nice. Because you have to realize that there are a lot of countries that have actually put out national hydrogen strategies. Right. And those strategies, in many cases, they connect to lots of different production technologies, but they ultimately right. connect to carbon capture as well. And so <clears throat> getting a clear line of sight on how you develop a market around hydrogen and at the same time promote a cost effective, viable carbon capture and sequestration industry it right. is not an easy task, right? And you've got to really think about, it's more than just the government's going to subsidize this or provide a tax credit for this, because right. that's great for stimulating interest, but it ultimately will just lead to bilateral deals. And that does not a market right. make, right? You need, you need liquidity, you need depth, you need transparency, because right. markets trade transparency at the end of the day. And so you got to think about market design. Um, and that ultimately gets into a discussion about how do you create transparent, transparent vehicles so that transactions can occur right. um, and participants can enter and exit um, and that at as little cost as possible. And that's a lot of what I see coming. In fact, I've already seen a couple of workshops and participated in a couple of workshops on that exact point, right? On right. how do you actually envision secondary markets and hydrogen evolving? You know, what sort of transparency protocols right. need to be put in place? Um, because there's a recognition that you need depth to, to drive liquidity and you need transparency to drive all of that. And only when you get that, will you promote uh, a, an investment platform that is low enough risk to attract a lot of different actors. And that's ultimately where we need to get. So there's a lot of interest on in all this stuff. And it's not easy, right? Because there's oh, no. thousands of special interests with different niches and different places they want to play in this. But at the end of the day, we've got to see it happen. And we have in other markets, like the natural gas market, for example. We right. saw this happen, you know, between the late 70s and early 90s. It was utterly transformed. That was an innovation in market design that allowed the market right. to double in size rel now relative to what it was then. So you know, there's a lot of potential there that needs to be captured, but right. um, it, it's going to make for a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, debate, quite frankly. When I got, you know, the only problem with our discussion, Ken, is you're bringing up so many points. I've got about <laughs> 19,000 questions that you just brought up. <laughs> I That's can tell good. We're, That's you know, good you're 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 doing it. I mean, this is a cool discussion, and we're going to have to have you back. Because I've got about 16 different things to follow up, but I got two two last questions here for you sure. in discussions. You know, there's a critical minerals uh, real, uh, and this may be something we may want to table to the next one. But hydrogen seems to me that we've missed the boat on compressed natural gas and hydrogen fuel cells to try to help out the renewable industry in the electronic vehicles. I mean, it seems like if we're talking, you kind of mentioned, it, or and I was thinking about this, is that as we build the hydrogen market, it seems that the hydrogen fuel cell would actually springboard that into some profitability into making some, some things. Um, the There was just a keel... Uh, laid, I believe, last week for one of the first cruise ships to be uh, LNG mm -hmm. and hydrogen. And I, I like that dual because the I'm going about six different ways as well here, too. But you can see where I'm going is how do we develop that other hydrogen fuel cell or that hydrogen dual use? Because, you know, it, it's. Yeah. It's so a couple of points that you raised there. Um, there has been in certain places a pretty robust set of policies that are really designed to promote low carbon energy sources. So I'll mention the state of California. They have a low carbon fuel standard. Um, right. That 
has not really driven the uptake of hydrogen fuel cells and passenger transport the way some had envisioned, right. but it has actually benefited electric vehicles. And you right. have to ask yourself the question why. It's because if I'm a buyer of a new car, right, I need to know that I can refuel the car, right? Right. If it's an EV, I can plug in almost any, I can plug in in my garage if I buy the kit to, you know, do that. So right. that reduces a risk of me being able to refuel the vehicle and drive it whenever I want to drive it. With right. a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, I've got to know that there's a there's a refueling station somewhere and those aren't right. really widely distributed. So you almost get into a chicken and egg issue. This gets into something called right. coordination, right? Um, you need coordination along a supply chain for an activity to really flourish. Um, right. For hydrogen to grow, um, I think there's a couple of things to point out. You need some large commitments, which is where heavy right. transport, shipping, industrial right. use, those provide a viable platform if you get a certain, you know, select large actors to move that you right. can start to facilitate growth. Uh, the other thing about heavy transport in particular, and this is where fuel cells come into play, is right. the routes for heavy trucks are, are relatively fixed. In other words, they're predictable because they're moving right. goods, right? And oh, so yes. you yes. can site refueling along those routes in very strategic ways to ensure that all of that happens unimpeded. And right. so it's likely that as we kind of move into this hydrogen economy, the first step is going to be the industrial core. So decarbonizing heavy industry through hydrogen applications, that's right. going to create a backbone that allows heavy transport applications to really flourish. Right. So this is going to be trucking. This will be, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day. Uh, if you're a large grocery distributor, imagine like the, the HEBs of the world, right? Right. Um, you've got need for energy 24 um, seven because you're running your warehouses all the time, right? You've got right. conveyor systems that are moving constantly um, and you right. also have to fuel trucks. And so there's a nice way to envision, you know, because you're trying to bring in a lot of electric power into those, those warehouses, envision right. developing, you know, electrolysis capability to make hydrogen right. refuel your trucks and kind of transition your entire fleet into a zero carbon fleet right, on that backbone. Um, but the other one that's probably going to springboard even faster than, than heavy trucking is, is, is maritime applications. You've already seen a big deal struck, for example, between Orsted and Maersk for Orsted to use wind power to make hydrogen so that it can right. use hydrogen to make methanol. So methanol can be provided as right. a green fuel to Maersk to operate its shipping fleet in and around port. So these yeah. sorts of things are, are going to happen. It's just a matter of we need them to happen enough so that we actually get depth. So it becomes a market and not just a bunch of one-off transactions. Oh, yeah. I, um, I'll tell you, um, I really do need to have you back because I'm sitting here every time you talk, I've got all these <laughs> other things that are just rolling in and everything. Sure. Um, but, you know, it's kind of funny when you sit back and there was a company that um, is putting masks on tankers. And so you, uh, your your comment about the the uh, um, maritime is the fuel and the regulations for pollution have yeah. just turned in, and I, I applaud them because if you look at the maps with all of the tankers and shipping cargos, that's a lot of pollution going on out there. Oh yeah, yeah. And it should have been fixed a long time ago. Reducing, and, and, and in particular, this this is not really even a carbon-related issue, right? This is more about particulates and, and other pollutants associated with the combustion of diesel right. fuel and fuel oil and whatever the case may be, especially when you get in and around ports, because what's true about ports? Right. They're at the center of major urban areas. Right. And so if you're polluting the air there, you're having direct implications for local populations. And yeah, to the extent we can eliminate that, that's great. Oh, yeah. So what's coming around the corner for you and the uh, foundation uh, or coming around? So what do you got coming around in the next quarter? Oh, boy, we're working on uh, several things. It's it's a, it's it's very fluid. Right. Uh, our work is is constantly evolving. Um and we'll continue to, to we, we host workshops um, on various nice. energy related issues. We engage uh, through congressional testimony, through testimony, right. through staff briefings, et cetera, uh, direct discussions with 
um, members of legislature, um, right. particularly at the federal level on various energy issues. And we'll continue to do that. Um, that's okay. kind of what, what we do on a daily basis. It's, it's a lot of fun, uh, again, elevating, not advocating, but trying to make everybody aware of, of all of the facts on the ground um, so that real good decisions can ultimately be made. So uh, more of the same is really, really what it, what it amounts to. Well, we've got your LinkedIn. We will put that in. We'll put your website in there as well. Is there any other place people can get a hold of you and then sign up for your classes? Because if they mention this podcast, I know it's going to be a guaranteed A. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to, to sign up for my courses, you'll have to be a student at Rice. So that's, oh, that's, okay. another, that's a different hurdle, right? Uh, um, but um, but yeah, people, they can find me on the web and, um, you know, my, okay. my contact details are actually on, on our webpage at the Baker Institute. So um, feel free to reach out. Sounds great. Thank you so much for stopping by the podcast. 